whatever, whatever technique you use to get to the effects, but you've short-circuited the work. I am not so sure that the presence of the effects has the same physical benefit as doing the work to get those effects. And that just doesn't apply to the technique we're talking about, but to any advanced technique where the person confuses the effects with the result. Now, it's entirely possible people are just saying, okay, boomer, you know, the old stuff is better. Well, it might be that, but again, it's a cliche, but if you could take a pill and get built the way you want and not exercise, I'm not so sure a lot of us would do that. I think a lot of us like the process. I'm not sure it actually works in terms of results, but it also deprives us of enjoying the process. Welcome to another episode brought to you by Imagine Strength, the future of safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Are you a hit studio owner looking for equipment that's not just top-notch, but also tailored to your specific needs? Imagine Strength is your answer. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength is revolutionizing the hit industry with their state-of-the-art yet affordable equipment. Their team doesn't just sell hit equipment, they live and breathe it. I've personally experienced their gear at the Resistance Exercise Conference, and let me tell you, it was an intense workout that I won't soon forget, in the best way possible, of course. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they provide customized solutions for HIT studios. Number two, they have budget-friendly yet high-performance designs. And number three, they're committed to innovation and excellence in high-intensity training specifically. Founder Jeff Turner and his dedicated team are on a mission to make HIT accessible to everyone. Getting started is easy. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, consult with their expert team. And number three, choose the equipment that will skyrocket your business. Don't wait. Head over to imaginestrength.com and elevate your hit studio today with Imagine Strength. Lauren Still here. and Welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your hit business and fueling your passion for high-intensity training. This is episode 448. My guest today is Bill Desimo. Bill is an ACE-certified health coach, senior fitness specialist, and owner of Optimal Exercise in Cranberry, New Jersey, and has certifications in functional anatomy, functional fitness, and orthopedic exercise. He's been training people since 1983, and he's also the author of Moment Arm Exercise, Congruent Exercise, and his latest masterpiece, Joint Friendly Fitness. Bill, welcome back. Good to see you. Hello, Lawrence. So, Bill, today, this is our part two, really, to our Q&A um, that we recorded recently, which actually, it will be published by the time this is out, but it's not published yet, which is fine, because we've got so many questions to uh, answer anyways. So, uh, you can see my presentation, right, Bill? You can see that clearly? Yep. Yep. So, that yep. means it should be shared with the audience as well. So, look, if... Um, <laughs> If you're not watching this, that's okay. I still think you'll get a lot of value just listening uh, on your favorite podcast app. Um, but if you are on, if you want to watch it, you can go to YouTube or uh, wherever there is video, um, and we're normally there. And you can actually see some of the slides we are uh, presenting on here, some of which might be useful to see when we talk about things like knee compression and stuff like that. So what I'm going to be doing is going through these slides and I've also collected lots of questions from other places that I will be asking Bill as well, um, but kind of using the slideshow as a, a way to keep it orderly and try and keep it on the same, uh, on the same kind of topic. So Bill, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> oh, and one last thought as well. Um, again, for listeners, if you would rather just jump to specific timestamps, you can actually go to the blog, highintensitybusiness.com, such episode 448, or just go to YouTube is another good place. And you can actually click the exact timestamp, which should have the topic or question. So if you don't want to learn about the leg press or Smith machine squats, but you'd rather learn about training clients, then you can just hop right there. Okay, so Bill, first question, I meet your friend Murray. Um, he says he definitely agrees with you about the medics leg press. Uh, many clients he's trained aggravated their lower backs, made the adjustment that sat higher up on the back pad. Um, I'd love your thoughts on this, and maybe you want to uh, uh, combine into this your recent experience with Tim Ryan. I don't know if that's relevant, uh, but take it away. Uh, so, so let's um, um, you know, give a little backstory to that. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess for a couple of years, 
in conversation with you and with others, I, I've kind of questioned the design of the Medex leg press seat, which builds in the wrong curve for the lumbar spine. So if, if the lumbar spine is supposed to be curved towards the front, um, actually, let me back up even further. It's pretty established that the safest way to load the spine is through the natural curves because in the natural curves, the pressure on the discs is even. And that comes from you know, the occupational health stuff and sports medicine uh, stuff. The medics, the, the Norlis Nitro leg press that I have and I'm a fan of builds into the seat back the curves of the spine. So when you sit on it, it fills in the curves of the spine and supports the natural curves. And, and what I questioned was why they built the Medex leg press with the reverse curve in the lumbar spine. So that when you set in the lumbar and the Medex leg press, instead of your, your lower back being curved towards the front, your lower back filled in into the, into the seat. Um, that was not a particularly popular viewpoint to express. <laughs> um, Anyway, so Mary here is agreeing with me with his experience. Um, I still don't know why Medex built it that way, but coincidentally, I visited, I happened to be in Illinois a couple of weeks ago and I visited Tim Ryan at his new studio. And uh, I walked in and we instantly got into a fist fight. <laughs> no, no, not real. Um, anyway, so it was a very pleasant visit. And I did notice that he had a lumbar pad attached, like, a, like an independent lumbar pad attached to his medic's leg press to fill in the curve in the lower back. And then when, um, in previous set, I had um, studied his instructions for setting up on the medic's leg press, which some people has characterized as the opposite of what I was saying to do. And actually, we have the same concerns in mind. I'm just using another nitro leg press. So the details of setting up are different than set up, setting up on the Medex leg press, which has more adjustments. But the concerns we both had were the same as far as the spine and the hip and the knees went. So it's really not that controversial if you're starting with the anatomy and biomechanics. Um, and I know some people have misinterpreted this. Uh, some people set me up in a medic's leg press claiming to be doing Tim Ryan's instruction and they had me balled up so tight that they had to lift the foot plate to get me started. Well, that's, that means when you're finished, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of in the crush position. Um, and that's definitely not what Tim intended. So, um, now, again, you know, there's also type of thing though, the, so, so Murray here says the clients aggravated their lower backs. Um, you know, the tricky part about this stuff is that might not be immediate. So you think, mm -hmm. you think, gee, Bill D. Simone doesn't know what he's talking about. I've trained people for years and they haven't gotten hurt yet. Well, it's not necessarily an immediate injury. So, um. You know, it's not, it's not an acute injury. Um, I think, however, though, if anybody does look at the sports medicine and occupational health type material, they'll see that it's obvious loading the spine with the curves bent the wrong way is, is generally contraindicated. There's no good reason to do it. So, but I appreciate the support from Murray. <laughs> good stuff. All right. Well, can we move on to a related question? Sure. Yeah. So. This is just, I just added this here because it's reference to the spine and back. And again, some of these questions, I don't know, they, they, they differ a lot in terms of their, um, yeah, let's just say they differ a lot. <laughs> so here we okay. go. If I carry the barbell weights completely on the arms and not the neck, and I'm going to assume they also mean upper back. Do you think that it makes the exercise less dangerous for the spine and back? Oh, maybe they didn't mean the upper back. I don't know what they mean. Uh, yeah, marginally, because if you're, if you're, 
So if, if we're the, what they're describing is a what, what used to be called the front squat, where the barbell was racked on the front of the collarbone mm -hmm. instead of across the back of the neck. And so it's probably marginally safer because if you lose it, you just drop it. Where if the bar is on your back and you lose it, you got a problem. I mean, there's, there's very little way of escaping an injury. Um, I still question whether... Um, I still question whether loading the spine to work your hips and your legs is, is a great idea, but if it's manageable and, you know, if to, if to your eye, you're protecting your posture and your, um, actually, I'm sorry. What that, do, what that does with putting the weight on the front of your collarbone versus the back is you're, you're, you're not axially axially loading the spine as much so the weight isn't going straight down through the, the through the spine and axial loading is another thing that's this that's contraindicated in the health literature so so for instance you have each vertebrae stacked with discs in between if you put a weight on top of that the axial loading there are no muscles that push the vertebrae apart to protect the discs. The muscles around the spine only either hold the posture of the discs or when you bend over, they contract to again, try to hold the posture. So there's no built-in mechanism for the spine to get stronger against axial loading. Again, because the muscles only contract. They don't, they don't, they're not like um, hydraulics pushing the vertebrae vertically. So. To the degree that the front squat doesn't axially load as much as the back squat, it probably is safer in that regard. Now, how much safer really depends on that individual's back. So it's hard to quantify. I'd say it's theoretically safer. Um, all things being equal, theoretically safer. The condition of that person's spine is probably the, 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 the determining factor. Got it. I, I, I mean, what, what occurs to me listening to you there is I, I'm just, I don't really understand the point in any of it in squatting. Um, I just think, you know, you, maybe this is, you, you've been saying this all along, Bill, but, um, you know, if we're doing, if we're doing a leg press movement, we're doing, you know, exercises that are getting at all of those muscle groups that one is trying to target with a squat, why bother? Why expose yourself to that risk? Am I preaching to the choir? Well, here you are, yes. Sure. Now, so um, I personally agree. I personally haven't barbell squatted in many years. Um, I'm pretty convinced the only thing I saved was back problems. Like, I don't think I lost on a muscular development, mm -hmm. um, such as it is. Such as it is for any of us, by the way. But okay, such as it is. Um, see, not to get too global here, because I really hate doing that, but most of us start exercising when we're teenagers or early 20s, and we're very impressionable, and we see guys squatting in the gym who look like they're big, and maybe we read something that it's a great functional exercise or a great sports exercise, and in your teens and 20s, we're not really studying biomechanics and sports medicine. So we're stuck with that's the way it's done. And you get away with it until about age 40. And then after you hit 40, all of a sudden, the um, consequences start to show. And so there's, you know, obviously in the greater um, audience for muscle media, there's this idea that, you know, the big guy's barbell squat or it's a man's exercise barbell squat. And yes, mm -hmm. it takes a lot out of you and you're winded and you're sucking wind and every muscle feels drained, but that's not necessarily the sign of a good feeling. It could just be, you know, you're crushing the spine. You're making it hard for yourself to breathe. So uh, that's why in joint friendly fitness though, um, my, my perception is that people resist being told, don't do this, only do this. Which you, which hit supporters are guilty of 
in, in the beginning phases of their evangelical zeal for hit, they're guilty of always do this or never do this. But um, when you're into it, you're resistant to that approach, right? So that's why in joint friendly fitness, I went to the star rating where I could say, well, look, if you're going to do this exercise, if you're going to barbell squat, here are the things you should be aware of. And if, that's, and if those are things that you don't really have to master, then here are the five-star exercises, which are generally going to be like idiot, almost idiot proof. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, where this conversation leads is, is almost to the futility of weight training, right? Like, um, I heard you say on a, on a podcast that you trained hitch style for two years. At the end of two years, you really couldn't tell that there was a difference. And I've heard Skylar say on your podcast that, you know, when you look at all of us doing it, our physiques don't really change. And, I, and excuse me if I'm misquoting him, but the gist no, of it right. was, that's right, yeah. The gist of it was, for all of our certainty, actually, that's my editorializing, but uh, so I'll just editorialize. <laughs> for, all of the certain, for all of the certainty the hit guys tend to have about how pure their workout is or how cutting edge it is with the studies and, or, or how it matches Mike Mensur or Arthur Jones or Ellington Darden. The reality of it is most physiques, even non-hit physiques, don't really change that much after that initial burst of, of adding muscle. Um, and again, the colloquial phrase is stay in shape. You don't, you, you know, you don't have a 16 inch, you don't go from a 12 inch arm to a 16 inch arm and then to a 19, then to a 21 inch arm. You know, it's, it, I, I lost interest in the sport of competitive bodybuilding when I realized, and it's going back to the seventies, when I realized, gee, Arnold's body looks like Arnold's body, just either more or less ripped. And Mensa's body looks like Mensa's and Zane looked like Zane. At a certain point, it's like, well, you're, you're bumping up against, you can't change this. You know, you can't change. Even with all the drugs. Even with all point. the drugs. Yeah. You can be a better you. But who's to say that, like, how can you say that Arnold at his peak was better than Mentor at his peak, was better than Zane at his peak? It's really just a question of when they were at their peak, if they were at their peak at the same contest, right? But a guy with no calves, no matter how many calf exercises he did or how intense, always had no calves. Mm -hmm. So it, it almost... Um, it almost points to, uh, if you're hung up on progress, you'll get frustrated very quickly and you won't last. But now getting back to, to like the micro example of you training for two years and, and not seeing any difference. If you didn't train for two years, I guarantee you would have seen the difference. Oh, Just yeah. not in the direction you would, we would have wanted. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that I'm trying to remember the context of that, but I wonder if it was whether... It was when I switched from doing like higher volume resistance training, um, which actually, when I think about it, my resistance training journey had been a slow progression of more abbreviation over time. So I did the higher volume stuff like three, four times a week, full body routines. When I say full body, I was, it was mostly just like biceps and chest, obviously, because, you know, you didn't want to, you were too, you know, didn't care about your leg development because at the time I had fairly muscular legs anyway, whatever, genetically or through basketball or what have you. But anyway, like I started coming across materials. I've talked about this before in the podcast. There's a book called The Spartan Health Regime, which is a romantic, um, you know, uh, a program based on obviously the Spartans. And that was at a really abbreviated strength workout. And then after that, I came across Doug McGuff and Body by Science, et cetera, and the rest is history. But to your point, because I'd been resistant to training for years before that, when I jumped to here, I can't say I saw any like significant gains. I didn't track it very well. So there is that. Maybe I did increase some muscle mass. Um, I just saw a massive amount of um, improvement in terms of strength and efficiency, right? Because of my recovery was probably more dialed in and maybe because I was just simply measuring stuff better. Um, but yeah, it, just to give context to your point, that's why... I'm not gonna. I'm not one of these people because you hear people who say, "Oh, I did here," and then I just, you know, everything took off. And I'm really skeptical of a lot of those claims. Um, and I think, I don't, not that I think these people are being dishonest. I think a lot of people are kind of tricking themselves. 
in a way. Yeah, I agree, um, with, that. I agree with that. I agree with that. Not, not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that generally. I'm sure there are cases where people have, you know, moved to a high intensity training protocol and seen genuinely really great results. You know. Well, again, just dipping our toe in global grandiose waters. I always thought, again, getting back to the fact that we start this when we're young and impressionable, and we're hung up on being the next Menser or, or being the best Arthur Jones adherent. Um, but I always thought the hit model would have been appealing to a much, the basics of the hit model would be appealing to a grand, bigger mainstream audience, right? But hit guys never promoted it that way. They all promoted how brutally difficult our workouts were and, and how, you know, I almost vomited, almost died from this workout. They promoted that when really, um, Promoting, well, a half hour, one, two, or three times a week, a whole body routine done very carefully, you'll get a lot of benefit from it. That's, that, that, I think, is the real selling point to hit. Doesn't mention intensity. Because again, right, train to failure and beyond versus just training enough. Can you really see the difference? Eh, see a difference? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. So, um, but I, but, but, but again, what I describe is not sexy. It's very hard to put in a, in a commercial or an ad. And since a lot of us hit influence people were talking to each other, we were more impressed with, we were more concerned with impressing each other than in yeah. being accessible to the mainstream. So. You also got me thinking, I'm reading a great book at the moment called Same as Ever by Morgan Housel. He's the guy that wrote Psychology of Money. Phenomenal read, really recommend it to, to yourself and listeners. Um, it's just a book on, you know, what doesn't change over the course of history, what stays the same. <laughs> and there's a lot of that, that we're, you know, if anyone's listened to, I did a really great, well, I, I, if I say so myself, I think it was great, um, podcast series with, uh, Dr. Dave Smith, who is a, um, psychologist lecturer, sports psychologist lecturer uh, at Manchester university, I believe, um. And we did this, whatever it was, nine part series on cognitive biases. It's fascinating. I learned so much talking to him. And so we looked at a lot of Daniel Kahneman's work, you know, thinking fast and slow, these types of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of what Morgan writes about in Same As Ever is, um, you know, a lot of these blind spots we have. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because what you just spoke about there in terms of hit, you know, when you and I talk rationally, logically about what the kind of the science supports and what our own experience supports in terms of results. It's not sexy, as you said, and it's kind of boring and people don't want to hear that or aren't as influenced by that, unfortunately. But when you tell a story, when you say, oh, you know, I was doing this protocol and it didn't work for me. And then I came across X protocol and suddenly I gained 30 pounds of muscle. People just get so into that, right? Because a story is so powerful. A story sells way better than facts do, right? Than logic does. Um, and I think that's something we got to keep in mind as hit evangelists, people who are trying to make hit or strength, smart strength training, whatever you want to call it, um, more popular is we have to understand that people buy into stories. They don't buy into logic and facts or statistics anywhere near as much. So we have to be honest with our storytelling. And that's something that a lot of people are not, right? And, and they, they use the story for, uh, a, a, you know, a, um, a, a negative, what, what should I say, an, in an un un unethical way to get what they want. Um, but it's, it's utilizing these, these things in order to, uh, to get more people to a straight training. Anyway, I'm kind of digressing. Well, see, and why I'll never be a great, you know, marketing or sales success is because I, I choke on a narrative that is demonstrably untrue. What is that? Um, well, for instance, some of the claims for hit that are clearly untrue, the opposite of reality, but it's part of the hit narrative to promote hit. Um, I can't watch it and I can't do it myself. <laughs> so, um, I see. Uh, I believe we touched on one in, in the previous episodes, let people do the work. <laughs> okay. I, I know what you mean. I think people can connect the dots. Uh, well, oh. yeah. So, but let's get yeah. back to grab. Let's get back to, 
ground level. Yeah, ground we, level we, stuff. We, we, we got to, we got to, uh, we got to make sure we stop uh, going off on tangents like this. So we actually get to people's right. questions. So, um, so connect. So again, related to the question regarding uh, squatting technique to be less dangerous to spider back, um, you raised the point about Smith machines. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about this? Smith machine squats? Sure. So I, um, uh, it was brought to my attention that somebody was criticizing my knowledge of biomechanics because I didn't criticize Smith machine squats vigorously enough. Um, and part of the, the, part of the argument was Bill doesn't know biomechanics because he doesn't understand that muscles and joints work in a rotary fashion, which is an old 50 or 60 year old Arthur Jones point that is, um, it's true without being useful. So for instance, for the people watching on YouTube, if you have to push a door open, you don't, you don't do this. You don't rotate your shoulder, rotate your elbow, and then extend, flex the wrist. You know, everything, all those rotary motions combine to approximate a linear motion. Okay. So now that argument about all muscles and joints work in a rotary fashion is generally used to justify single joint exercises, flies, leg extensions, leg curls. As if, as if somehow the fact that the exercise works in a rotary plane is, is better than a compound exercise because muscles and joints work in a rotary motion. Um, well, that, that's, I would say that's almost irrelevant because when you climb steps, when you push doors open, you do move effectively in a linear fashion, just as a combination of rotary motions. Okay. And when you're, and when it comes to exercises that use more than one joint, the, the cam effect is almost built in as I think I belabored in moment arm exercise. Whereas if you use a single joint motion, the cam effect is, um, it's much more pronounced when the mismatch occurs. So if you're doing a, a pullover, which I know people asked about. If, if you're doing a pullover with a dumbbell, that clearly mismatches um, the cam effect of the dumbbell and the muscle torque of the, of the shoulders. So for that exercise, the pullover machine is a good solution. Um, but uh, so the Smith machine squat, I wouldn't say that that's one of those exercises that I don't, recommend it's more like okay if you're going to squat and you're going to use a smith machine squat because you perceive it as being safer and that the bar won't crush you here's how you would do it and how you do it by the way is you have to use the bottom stops you have to set the bottom stops uh, and if the machine doesn't have bottom stops don't use that particular station um, because there are Document, I used to document this in, in the other earlier books where the guy became a paraplegic because he was squatting in the Smith, Smith machine, broke the lock in his knees, the bar went straight down, there were no bottom stops, crushed the spine. And in the lawsuit, the manufacturer said, well, we, we surveyed all Smith machine usage, which he didn't, but okay. And we found nobody used the bottom stops. We always found the bottom stops on the floor, so we never built it into our machine. Well, that's so now what you have is a guillotine, right? You, it's not now. It's not safer. Um, assuming you you set the stops so it's not going to crush you. The the way the levers change, and I, and I showed this a moment on my exercise. The way the levers change for the glutes and for the quads matches the muscle torque patterns for glutes and quads. So it's fine there. You still have the axial loading of the spine, which again, if you're aware of and you choose to do it, that's one thing. Um, but the biggest mistake with the Smith machine is relying on being able to do a wrist curl when you're fatigued and, and not 
So if you rely on, on the hook getting the peg when you are fatigued, that's a, that, that adds some risk to the whole, uh, the whole process. So, so I would say I'm not a fan of the Smith machine, but if you're going to use it, these are the things to know about it. Mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's not inherently bad just because it's not, you know, individual rotary motions. Um, as far as that goes. Now, yeah, there's a question here about Turkish get-ups, um, <laughs> which is, again, a lot, of, a lot of combined motions. So that, to my eye, that goes too far the other way. That's combining too many motions, so it's very tough to manage it. But um, um, just before, but anyway. you, before you go there, um, I've got a note here to show the knee images on the slideshow. Um, should we, should we wait till we've gone through some questions I've got here and the ones you can see on the screen and then show the knee images to kind of illustrate your point about the knee compression and so on and so forth. So we'll get to scuba 453's comment about a shame. Okay. I can't see Bill's drawing about the knees and the leg press that those are the next slides. If I, yes, those are All the right. next we'll, slides. We'll, we'll, so we'll come get to that. We'll come on to that yeah. in a bit. So yeah, do you want to, so the Turkish get up, um, you know, anyone can sort of Google that to to see it. Uh, I'm not going to bring it up now because I don't want to mess with the presentation. Um, but it's a it's a very popular exercise. If you Google it, you can you can see it. it's just someone who's lying on their side of a usually with a kettlebell for the most part, and they're slowly whilst keeping was it keeping the arm completely straight and locked out to their side and pointing up at the ceiling. They're slowly basically getting up into a, a standing position from being lying down on the floor. That's one way of explaining, it, isn't it? Not very well, but I would yeah. describe it as as more of a stunt than an exercise. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I if somebody wants to do it as a challenge, and I guess if you can, if you can manage your postures and your joint positions while you are doing it, good luck. Um, I, I I think it's unlikely you're going to manage your postures and joint positions. But, um, so I think this would qualify as, look, if, if it's a stunt you want to try and want to master it for its own sake, um, you know, okay, I'm not going to try to deprive somebody out of a, you know, sense of accomplishment, but I, I don't think, I don't think it, it's, I don't think you can go through again, sports medicine, biomechanics, occupational health and justify doing it as, as a, as something good for your body. What's the value in doing it? I have no idea. Makes you breathless. Because like, obviously you're, you're utilizing a lot of muscles in order to get in that position. You're keeping a very, a, a, a very real world position, by the way. <laughs> you know, because I can imagine your child climbing onto you as you're lying on your side and you decide, okay, we're going to stand up now. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think it's just a stunt masquerading as an I exercise. See. Yeah, I see. Okay. Uh, so you don't think, in conclusion, you just think there's way better ways, there's far more, far more better, effective and safer ways to probably achieve the same outcome, um, less, right. less achieving the skill of a Turkish, Turkish get up. Yeah. Again, yeah. And again, if somebody, if somebody wants that skill, I, I'm not going to disparage them for wanting that skill, but I, I, there's just a lot of, lot more efficient, effective mm -hmm. ways of getting whatever physical benefit you think you're getting out of it. Okay. So what about this one about wall sits with weights? You know, I think wall sits are a fine substitute for various quad work. Um, do you need extra weight? I guess if you, if you can do a wall sit for 90 seconds and not feel your quads burning and not fall through the floor, I guess extra weights would make it more challenging. Um, um, but, um, again, as long as you're not putting that extra weight on your spine, if you're holding that extra, like a plate across your chest or dumbbells to your sides, um, I, I had that moment in moment arm exercise. I, I didn't put that in, um, I don't think I put it in good, a joint friendly, but not for any particular reason other than I wanted to feature other exercises. Um, but if you don't have a yeah. leg press, if you train at home, for instance, I think it's a perfectly legit way of training quads and saving a lot of spine um, discomfort. 
You're not a fan of um, was it crowbarring the knee? So when you come when you some people will finish a wall a wall sit and they'll just slam down onto the floor. Oh, which obviously is we'll, more if you've got weights in your hand, it's more likely to happen as well. As we'll see in the next slide, no. Okay, all right, we'll go into that. We'll save that, park that one then. Um, and do you want to answer the question around knees over toes, and then we'll get into the the images. So the, the, the question I got on YouTube, uh, or right. uh, we got on YouTube was knee over toes, guys, thumbs up or thumbs down. And I just answered with a thumbs down. Um, I see. For the reasons that will become apparent. Oh, so um, it's it just mainly around the, the knee issues is that we're going to go into it? Or is there other concerns that you want to address about his work? So I, I don't follow the guy um, because he's... This is the influencer, um, the influencer approach to life, where you say something that is so clearly contraindicated in the conventional wisdom, make some claim over it, uh, and then you, and then you justify it by saying nobody does this because you know you have the secret knowledge. This is the secret knowledge to knee stability and knee protection that nobody else does. Yeah, nobody else does it because it's so clearly contraindicated by any responsible. Um, party that knows anything about needs. So, um, and just like some other things where I think we'll get to, like, you know, ha dead hanging off a chinning bar, and all of these things that are clearly go against the conventional wisdom and that's their appeal. Oh, uh, you know, nobody does this because it's, because this is the secret way we're going to prevent doctors from getting surgeries. That's not, that's not true. Nobody does it because it's such a clearly bad idea. Um, so I, I don't, you know, if, if it's the same guy I'm thinking of, he suggests doing the DARD, you know, exercising the tibialis mm -hmm. for knee stability. Well, that muscle doesn't cross over the knee joint. It's irrelevant to knee stability. It might help with ankle stability. It might help with shin splints. It's not, it's not a bad idea to do that exercise, but it has nothing to do with knee stability. Mm -hmm. So, um, influencer. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the guy to really comment. And, um, but, uh, what you're saying seems to ring true for a lot of obviously influencers out there, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, yeah, some, no, some of this stuff, it. I'm not going to, um, you know, some, some, if somebody leads with something that's so blatantly, uh, provocative, I'm probably not going to go deeper into his stuff to find the one or two nuggets that's useful. Yeah. Um, and, and now, you know, and even writers I like, like, you know, Ellington Darden, for instance, I, I don't think I've hidden my respect for his work. That doesn't mean every book he has, I do everything in every book he has. Of course, yeah. But, he, but he's got an instant, um, his work has an instant, entry into me picking through it to see, okay, what one new thing can I find here? Whereas somebody like Neil Vito, let's leave him out of it, but other, inf other people trying to be influencers who lead with the, something that's so clearly a bad idea. And maybe it's a good idea in such a narrow amount of cases that it might as well be not used. Yeah. That guy, I'm not going to spend my time reading to find the one nugget of something useful. But. Yeah, it's always interesting because I wonder about what about all the people, if what you say is true in terms of like a lot of what you're saying is contraindicated, that means that there's probably a huge amount of people out there who have been injured or got injured doing some of his techniques. Well, well But you don't hear about any of those. Be. You don't hear about any not. of those because of course not. No, one wants to, not. no one wants to be public about their failures, right? Um, no one's going to try and take the guy down because he's too big now anyway. So You don't want to be the crank. <laughs> Right, exactly. And having and having some experience with calling people out, um, in my less experienced social media days, the 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 ganging up on by his uh, his um, the, the, by their supporters is just not worth the aggravation. Right, and that's even if you put aside bots and other and other gimmicks, you know. So, right, nobody nobody um, the person paying for the good publicity, public, nobody's paying for bad publicity. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you're selling the book, you're going to pay for the good publicity. The person who gets hurt by your stuff isn't going to spend money to take you down. There's no, there's no upside for it. So. Absolutely. 
All right. So, um, okay. So let's move on to the knee images. Um, so scuba four five three. Shame I can't see a thing. Bill's drawing about the knees and the leg press. I think we were you were trying to draw and we were trying to film it and record it and then put it up on the podcast, but it just didn't come out very very well. That's probably our fault. Um, so anyway, here's some very very good uh, drawing from yourself. Um, I forgot to sign it. Darn. <laughs> so do you want to just talk us through this? So um, I tried to put this, this was a moment arm exercise and I think I, I, I've alluded to, but I haven't, didn't elaborate as much in the later books, um, but what compression at the knee is. So um, if you look at the, the right side of the picture where you see what my representation of a thigh bone, a femur and a tibialis, the shin, they're almost vertical. You see, and then you have the green dot, which represents the kneecap. So what the, what the patella does is it keeps the line of force from the quads. It creates a little internal moment arm. Um, you can live without a patella. But is that what the blue is? The blue is a patella, is it? Or is it something else? Well, the, the green, for right now, I'll go with the green is the patella. Oh, right, sorry. Okay. So what happens is the quad tendons merge into the patella tendon. The patella tendon goes on to attach to the tibia. Mm -hmm. So you can live without a patella, but then your quad tendons go very close to the center of the knee and they will not be as strong as with a patella. What the patella is, does is it puts a pulley in effect into your knee. It keeps the line of force from your quads away from the center of your knee. It creates an internal moment arm and now your quads are stronger with that internal moment arm than without. And when the, when the thigh and the shin are almost vertical, the patella does the job of deflecting the force away from the center of the knee. So for instance, most steps in a house in a building are a certain height because most people's legs can bend just about that much to go up the steps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, with um, when you flex the knee too much, so when you are in the in the left side of the diagram, when you've broken a ninety degree angle, and now you're acute. Now, now you're. Let's say now the the hamstring is touching the calf, right? So the bottom of an ass to the ground squat, or the bottom of a walking lunge, or or the, an extreme leg extension. Well, now the, the patella is still trying to do its job to keep the line of force from the quads away from the center of the knee. But because of where the tibia is, it's now pulling the kneecap into the center of the knee. It's no longer just deflecting. Now the blue, which I should have made red, that's the underside of the knee where the connective tissue, bursa, et cetera, are. And that's what's going to get inflamed when you load the knee in that position too frequently or too severely. So this is what compression at the knee is. It, well, it has to do with where the joint angle is because at a slightly bigger joint angle, there's, there's less compression. But then once those, once those bones go smaller than 90 degrees, the resistance force is pulling on the knee almost in the same direction as the muscle force. It's just pulling the kneecap into the, into the joint. If you read any running material, runner magazines, chondromalacia and, and chondromalacia where the underside of the kneecap is irritated is a big concern. Okay. And that's with, with running where you're not really loading the knee at that extreme angle. So if you're squatting at that extreme angle or um, you are a baseball catcher, before they had the different devices to, to, to give you some room back there, baseball catchers would regularly go into a deep squat for nine inning games, 160 games a season, and eventually they turned into outfielders or first basemen because the knees just weren't built to, to accommodate that. There's actually recorded like injuries from being in those positions for so many games. Not, it, see, again, and here's where we're going to, not necessarily an acute injury. It's not like a, 
the catcher goes into okay. a squat and immediately ruptures an ACL or mm-hmm. PCL or meniscus. But over time, you have little wears, little wears, little wears, and then it turns into something. So, so, but what if you're, it's okay. So even if you're not loaded, you're not, um, well, you are, but you are loaded if your yeah. body weight's load. Yeah. I guess. So, so a lot of people, so, you know, there's a lot of people who might advocate being in a squat position, kind of like a hunter gatherer type of squat, right? Cause they used to, uh, the theory that they used to rest in those positions. I don't know how true that is. You know, the kind of thing I mean, like ask the grass, like kind of like a catcher, I guess I'm not obviously familiar with baseball, but you know what I mean? Go ahead. But <laughs> I, I mean, that's, that's touted as being like a natural a, movement, a natural movement, one which you sh- position you should get into fairly regularly as much as you can in order to make sure that you still have the skill to do that. Like you do Portal and these movement experts uh, will, yeah, will, okay. will go on about that kind of thing. Yeah, go on. And how do you know hunter gatherers didn't have knee arthritis at age 30? Well, very, very good point. It might be a natural movement. It might be something you have to do. But how do you know there weren't consequences? Mm-hmm. Again, just keeping just keeping this, this, this up in our in our awareness. Jones and Menser and Darden in the 1970s, when they were writing, didn't anticipate the same guys doing the same things 50 years later. Like, how could you? Mm-hmm. So it might be what people do or have to do as part of, you know, people always bring up the uh well, you know, in certain indigenous cultures, they squat to go to the bathroom. They deep squat to go to the bathroom. Well, okay. But you don't know that they don't have knee problems later in life. <laughs> so, mm. Yeah. Um, and have, but, but having said that, you know, if you're doing this as part of a yoga routine, if you're not doing it to excess with extra load, you probably get away with it. It probably isn't a bad idea to make sure you can get into that position. You want to, play, you know. If, if you're a grandparent and you want to play with kids, you want to be able to get down there. So that's fine. But the idea that you're going to regularly load with weight, with, for, with extra weight, with extra force to failure, however many times a week you work out, hmm. that you're going to get away with that indefinitely, that, that's, that's not the case. Today's episode is sponsored by Imagine Strength, the game changer in safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training machines. When it comes to HIT, Imagine Strength is your go-to for intelligently designed, efficient, and affordable equipment. Their team is passionate about HIT, and it shows in every piece they craft. So why are Imagine Strength the right choice? Number one, they tailor-make their equipment for HIT studios. Number two, they provide cost-effective solutions for your business. And number three, they are committed to ongoing innovation and refinement. Ready to take your hip business to the next level? Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and find the perfect gear for your studio. Join the hit revolution of Imagine Strength and transform your workout experience today. So just to put this into context, so what we're saying here is avoiding... Am I correct in saying, you know, like you were saying about the leg press, about where you're in that position where the feet are, the, the femurs are really close to your chest, like that start position, that type of thing. Is that a similar, I'm just trying to picture the angle in my head. That's similar, right? In terms of the knee compression. Next Same slide. S- next slide. Oh, oh, have you got it in the next one, have you? You're getting very predictable, Lawrence. Look at that. I promise you I didn't do that deliberately. You're getting very <laughs> predictable, Lawrence. I can, <laughs> I can anticipate where you're going. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, so this is more. This is more to illustrate the crowbar at the hip. But if you okay. could, so, but if you can imagine, in some of the um, home model leg presses, all right. Um, the foot plate. If you can take that foot plate and drop it down to the level of the the practitioner, the trainee's butt or lower, right. And then the feet, instead of being where they are, the feet are, say, in the same line as the butt, so that there'd be a really hard angle at the knee. It's the, it would be the same effect as the ass to ground squat. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and, and, and again, you know, if, um, I, why the, the designers of, of equipment either aren't aware of this. I'll assume they're not aware of this because they're coming at it from the point of view of 
the exercise world, not the sports medicine world, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's what your body does that counts. It's not the name brand on the equipment. Um, so in terms, so again, I, I would know. So for instance, this is about the hip, but I would not set somebody up so close on the leg press that you you can't avoid a ninety uh, uh, squeezing the the patella. Like you have to have some room between the calf and the hamstring. Yeah, exactly I, 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 that wasn't a very good example, to be honest. But no, I actually, but but again, if it was, if somebody has a a, a a leg press machine that came with a multi station unit for the home. Mm -hmm. generally that is how they build the leg press so that you are very upright, your feet are at the level of your butt and it's almost unavoidable that your knees bend into the compression position. I see. So it is a relevant question to any listeners who have home exercise equipment, Chris. Okay. Just before we ex um, elaborate on the, the impingement of the hip, the crowbar of the hip, which I'm really interested in getting into for a moment here. Um, can you just, just, just address this one for me? So if you're in, and this might be interesting to those who asked about the warset, um, cause I, I'm a fan of warsets. I do them fairly regularly. If you, so if I hit, well, I never truly hit muscular pain in warsets cause it's really uncomfortable, but, um, so much, yeah. right. So your, your, your advice is don't fall to the floor, push off the wall and uh, stand up. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like eek up, eek yeah. up. When you feel you're losing it, go up about an inch and hold there. And then when you feel you lose that, right. go up about an inch. And then, you know, not, not to get into sequencing, but obviously if, if you want more intensity, because obviously you're not going to go quite as deep intensive fatigue. If you do that, then you can just sequence it with, you know, freehand squats or other, other leg exercises. Um, but what I do currently, I will admit, I will, I will fall to the floor and I don't feel any uncomfortable sensation in as a result of doing so. But obviously I'm assuming my risk is higher because I am more fatigued. And so when I am crashing down to the floor, even if I were to do it with more control, maybe there is more, I don't know, compression forces on the knee is there as, like, as you come down in that position, is that? Well, that and the twisting, the twisting could be a problem also. Like, so if you, if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, let's say you're, you're on a carpet with a, a conventional athletic shoe on uh -huh. and the bottom, like your feet don't slide. And as you fall through, if your knee twists one way, twisting is also problematic. I've never had twisting that I can think of. Good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. But, Good. But, but to your point, like this is something we, you know, is this, am I right in thinking this? So this might not have an acute injury, right? I fall to the floor, there might not be any sensation in knee, totally fine. I'm 36 years old, big deal. But the point you're trying to make is if I did this every week in 10, 20 years, I could have a problem constantly exposing my knee to these forces through doing that. That's, that's your argument. I, is I, it? You know, it yeah. could be that you have like, you know, small tears that you don't notice. Sure. Right. Um, I, I, you know, which, by the way, depending on what you do outside the gym, you might be bringing on anyway. So, you, you know, that, that's part of, part of the nuance of, of what I'm describing is people's physical activity isn't limited to what they do in the gym. It's all the same body. Mm -hmm. um, um, again, if somebody, if, look, if you're controlling the fall and you don't think it's creating a problem, it might not be. Um, but I think though, let's say, let's say you're, you're doing the wall sit and mm -hmm. you're, you're targeting 90 seconds and at 70 seconds, your legs are really shaking, burning beyond repair. Instead of crashing to the floor, if you come up an inch, you're changing the leverage a little bit, which has the effect of lowering the weight. Your muscles still have to work to hold you at that slightly higher position. Okay. It's like a breakdown set or a forced rep. Yeah, it's like the easy range though, isn't it? So that actually makes sense. It's a, it's a slightly easier range, but you're already yeah. fatigued. Yeah, so is, he, is this a safe kind of logical way to it's get out of the exercise? It's a safer way of extending yeah. your set. Yeah, yeah, I'll do, yeah, um, I'll do that. And then if you're near, near locked out and your legs are quaking, well, 
then you just lock out and you, and you don't fall to the floor. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you know, the other thing too is at cer at a certain age, <laughs> at a certain age, those of us hit influence had to say, well, okay, I haven't trained fully to failure. I haven't lost control of my negative. But how confident am I that I'm going to survive that? You know, how durable are my joints? Mm -hmm. And as you get older, you start to say, well, like, like I heard James use the phrase, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever potential benefit I get from really squeezing out that last couple of seconds of, of quad burning, you know, vomit inducing effort, how much am I really going to benefit from that versus cutting it short and walking away to train another day? Yeah. Which I think comes with, you know, at a certain, like, you know, a, you hear, from, you hear of somebody rupturing ACL and you're like, maybe I shouldn't be playing basketball quite as vigorously. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, this is uh, sound advice. Uh, that's what I love about your materials, actually, is, um, you know, I don't think that any anyone is going to get any less benefit by following your approach in terms of, like, hypertrophy or strength, et cetera. I think we've made some good, a good case about that at the start of this podcast, in fact. Um, and I, I understand, and you might push back on this, Bill, but I understand why some people might push back on what they see you as maybe being too safe if that's even makes any sense but it's like well why wouldn't you be as safe as you possibly can if the results are basically going to be the same there's no downside to it but actually you're just maximizing safety do you know what i'm saying if you think that well like maybe even if you are of the belief that bill's approach to certain exercise advice is extreme in terms of safety well maybe that's a that's reducing that risk so significantly such that it makes sense. You know, I've, uh, I gave up a long time ago on being the toughest guy on the internet. <laughs> so, um, you know, back in the early days of social media and message boards in two thousands, where fighting with people was sort of like, you know, you trained and then you fought with people for hours over training. What a waste of effort. So, um, 100%. If people, you know, when people are ready for the material, it's, it's out there. I, I just put it out and how people interpret it or react to it. Um, it's somewhat beyond my control, right? If they want to talk about it, I'm happy to ask about it. They want to argue about it. If the argument is a sign of interest, fine. If they just look into score points somewhere, you know. Yeah, I respect that. So, so look, um. I'm just aware we're gonna to to, Bill, are you trying to get a part three? Is that what you're trying to do here? Because we're not we're not we're not we're not even making a dent in these questions, right? You're you're so, guiding this man. You're guiding this man. I am I'm shocking. I'm so <laughs> I'm just too too narcissistic and focusing on my own questions. Um, shall shall we cut to the end and then and then back up or should we um No just, no I, I think we still go okay. through the no, through the We're good. Go ahead. I think we're good. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no. So time wise, um you're good to run for another what, uh thirty minutes roughly? So, right? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. So, um, we're focused on uh, we have crowbar the crowbar of the hip. hip. Crowbar of the hip. So, yeah, talk, just talk me through why this is a really precarious position for the hip in this image. Oh, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> lost, lost track. It's all good. Okay, so hopefully um, that the listeners like the little tangents we go on, Bill. So that's the hope, well, anyway. That, that, that's why you have that outline with the uh, timestamps. That's right. That's right. Okay, anyway, um, crowbar at the hip. So this is only an issue when people advocate super deep squatting or super deep uh, lunges. Okay, so for, for most, of, most, most exercise media, this never came up or exercise practice. Um, and again, nobody does it this way. I have the secret to better hips. Well, nobody does it this way because it's a bad idea. So I've seen uh, commentary on the internet that you have to deep as, squat as deep as you can to really get at the deep muscles of the hip. And when you copy this, the, the body position, you do feel something in the hip. But what you're feeling is not muscle work. What you're feeling is impingement, 
you're feeling the, the crowbar effect trying to pull your connective tissue apart. Um, again, crystal clear if you can wade through the sports medicine literature, but to somebody in exercise, this is brand new because generally we never tried to get into this position. So what happens is you have the femur, which is a very clearly a very long lever. Okay. And when you push the femur as far against the hip as you can, all right, where it contacts the hip is like the axis of the crowbar. That's going to bear, bear the brunt of, of, of the effort. The other side of the crowbar, where you're trying to lift the heavy object, is a connective tissue in the hip. So when you do this in exercise, when you squat so deep that you feel it in the hip or you do a lunge so deep um, that you feel the hip, you're feeling the femur push up against the socket, feeling that impingement. And then on the other side, you might be feeling the connective tissue trying to hold things together. Um, this is not good. This is not developing muscle, right? The deep muscles around the hip, they act to stabilize the hip. They act to stabilize the ball of the femur and the hip joint. They're not, to get them, to try to act, get them to act as prime movers is really overloading them in a way that they're, they're not going to benefit from. Mm -hmm. So those muscles aren't going to hypertrophy significantly because if they did, you wouldn't be able to move your hip. Like you wouldn't be able to move your thigh in the hip. Right. Um, um, now, again, this, it, it, in most, um, even in the muscle magazines from the 50s to the 70s, they never addressed this because they never advocated it. Um, so there was no need to address it because it didn't occur to anyone to do this. Right. Um, but since then, as the more extreme stuff tries to get more clicks and more views, and it has the veneer of, of deep thought behind it, like, you know, like, oh, I never thought to work the deep muscles of my hip. Well, yeah, because they're working whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would be, so just to, on this, this image, just describe to me the, the bit on the bottom where it says, acts the really beautiful drawing, Bill. I just couldn't definitely do this better myself. Um, <laughs> The bit at the bottom where it's got effort, axis, and is that an R? What does that mean? Resistance. Resistance. Okay. So you're, okay. So the axis is that the hip joint where all the connected tissue is being crowbarred out, right. et cetera. Yeah. Right. So, so if you use a conventional crowbar, mm -hmm. you don't slip the long end under the load, under the crate, and try to push the short end. No, right. 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 You slip the short end under the crate and you get as far away from the long end as possible because it, creates the lever in your favor, not in the resistance's favor. Mm -hmm. So the analogy here is the femur is the long part of the crowbar where it's in this particular range of motion, which, which again, is not really a natural range of motion, right? You, you won't get out of bed and find yourself in that position. You won't, you won't find the step that big that you're gonna find yourself in that position. It is an extreme range of motion. Mm -hmm. But again, so if your femur is pressed up with your knee coming as close to your chest as you can, the femur is hitting the front part of the hip. That's the pivot. That's the axis. And then the other end of the femur, where the connective tissue and deep muscles are, that's the resistance. Got it. So um, again, you don't, you don't really find this... Um, Certainly not in the muscle media, because it was never really a prominent part of exercise instruction um, until social media comes along. And again, nobody's doing it this way because it's the yeah. secret knowledge that it, they don't want you to know. So, okay. So I guess the question I have then is when doing a leg press, what do you advocate in terms of the starting position? Like how far away should the femur be from the torso in order to prevent impingement of the hip. So, you know, I, I just happened to have a, a publication. All right. Got well, it, yeah. You just have to break out your copies of Joint Friendly Fitness. The first there you go, guys. 
first person shows where the femur is as close. Like I've pushed the seat as close as I possibly can on the nitro leg press. And the seat is as vertical as it gets. Got it. So the, in the picture, the, the femur is vertical and it's almost into who happens to be my daughter's armpit. That's the, the don't do position. The do position, the scenes lean back at about 45 degree angle is about a right angle at the knees and about a right angle, slightly less than a right angle at the hip. Got it. So, so there's clearly space between the calf and the knee and between the front of the quad and the lower ab. So you can, you can see space. Yeah. Where that is on, on an individual, especially an older individual, really depends on where things hurt. So you, you just, you just kind of have to, you know, you eyeball the theoretical best position. Yeah. And then as they do the rep, if they wince or if they say this hurts, you have to adjust it based, based on what's in front of you. Thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense. Let me just throw you a slight curveball. Don't know if I can call it that, but I don't want to name any companies or names or anything like that. But obviously that there are organizations who will do the opposite, who will have the knee jammed right up to the chest and not do that at scale. We're talking thousands of workouts every single week. And what your kind of way I understand your, your theory, Bill, is that, okay, why not have an acute injury? Might get away with it for 20 years. And then one day, you know, it causes a serious problem with the hip. Maybe you need a hip replacement, I don't know, or a tear or yeah. something. Right. Um, but, but I'm just, I don't know, one of, one of my slight skepticisms of this is I just haven't seen it, I guess. But then maybe... It's like we were saying, maybe people don't come out and say it. Um, maybe they're just like, it's like the invisible graveyard as uh, Doug often talks about regarding strength training and hypertrophy. It's, you know, you just, there's a lot of people we don't see who, who maybe, uh, you know, suffer as a result of this, perhaps. Well, as I think I said in a previous chat with you, mm -hmm. um, you don't see it in the popular literature. You certainly don't see it in people's narrative as they're trying to build their empire. But where you see it is in the academic literature, where, um, if you, again, when my intern searched on the academic literature for exercise and injuries, we had hundreds of thousands of hits. Where they were in the sports medicine literature, person did this, this, or this person presented with this injury, they had been doing this. Um, so, so number one, obviously people can claim what they want. They may actually believe it because mm -hmm. the person whose hip is bothering him drops out. They don't necessarily say, by the way, my hip's bothering you. I think it was because of that machine. They just drop out. They don't announce that they're dropping out. Yeah. They just disappear. Possible. Um, the other thing is, and I, I don't have the article handy with me, but I, I know it's referred in the uh, bibliography. They just shared me off to the fat bill. Yeah. But, no, no, but... but um, oh, we can just, yeah, just point people to join Friendly Fitness. Sure. Not too, too long ago, Washington Post article about hip problems resulting in exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and the gist of the uh, millennials are flocking to high intensity workouts and hip pain follows December, 2016. The gist of the article was orthopedic surgeons as such were seeing hip injuries that they hadn't seen in any kind of numbers before. Mm -hmm. And it was all coming out of people doing jumping exercises, deep squatting exercises, walking lunges. Et there's, a, there's a lot going on there though, right? Ballistic forces and. True, but the point, the point of the matter is the reports of it have to hit a certain threshold before I anyone see. hears of it. I see. So it doesn't mean that the condition doesn't exist. It means it hasn't been reported enough or enough people haven't gone. Um, enough people haven't reported injuries enough to become part of the awareness. What, what's, what is the, the injuries that, that you, know, you, you think that this, uh, this can cause over time? What, what? What is this sort of impingement? What can it cause? What sort of long-term problems that you, you foresee here? Um, labral tears, hip labral tears. Okay. A friend of mine, a physical therapist, working with a trainer. So she knew better. Uh -huh. She got caught up in working with the, I'm sorry, working with the trainer. Deep walking lunges, 
Now, again, this woman who's very physically active and may have had other things leading okay, so to it. Could be compounders, but, sure. But yeah. everybody has that. Right. Everybody it's just difficult to, to pin, a, pin it on that, though, isn't it? It's difficult to pin it on that, but if, yeah. but if, but if you have the information that leads you up to that point, you can stick your head in the sand and say, well, until it's proven that it creates this, I'm just going to go with it. Or you can say, well, you know, everything, all the, all the, all the conditions are right. Why am I flirting with the, the problem? Right. Um, right. And again, getting back to what we talked to earlier, I understand some people want to create a narrative that they have the secret knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, the, the sales shtick. Um, but this is actual knowledge that just isn't, commonly available um and again i would say i would say this where this exists is in the academic sports medicine literature um, yeah um for instance you will never see name brand equipment associated with a specific injury in the in the medical or mainstream liter literature because not enough people use it yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If let's pick on an old piece of equipment, an old original Nautilus pullover that encouraged you to, to really hyperextend the, um, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Cause I know I'll take to overflex the shoulder under a load. Right. Mm -hmm. Clearly a recipe for an injury, but not that many people did it or they were doing it say in the seventies and realizing this hurts my shoulder. I'm going to stop doing it. Mm -hmm. So the proof of its, um, the proof of its role in an injury isn't established because there wasn't the volume. I see. So, yeah, yeah. Fair point. Fair point. Um, and again, sometimes I like your point about being better safe than sorry. Look, if you're going to get all the same benefit by having a slightly adjusted starting position, I think that makes a lot of sense. So let's, um, and, and also, go ahead. are we talking about the difference between a Tom Platt's thigh and a minute bowl thigh here? Uh, we are not, no. we are not all of the people who will say, all of the, the people of the narrative will say, well, we've done it this way. What difference is it making? Can anyone look at my clients, their clients? Anybody else's clients and say, oh, I can tell exactly how they're training. No. Yeah. I, I, it's interesting. I wonder if there's um, a client experience benefit to having a quote unquote greater range of motion, although I'm not sure the range of motion is that much greater. Um, a feel, yeah. a certain feel of the exercise, although you alluded to earlier about how that feel might not be uh, as desirable as we think. <laughs> feel, is probably, but, but that's part yeah, of yeah. the narrative, playing yeah. up the feel. Yeah. So. Yeah. So look, um, I'd like to move on if that's okay, Bill, um, yeah. on, on this slide. So let's have a look, just time checking that quickly. So uh, let's move on. So I've got a question here. So let me see the next slide. Okay, one second. So uh, before we talk about the pullover there, um, so I've got another question here. Was wondering what your take on deadlifts are. I only asked because I had pretty bad back pain and I'm trying to find a reliable way to activate my hamstrings. Your thoughts on that? Um, let's see. But you have back, bad back. Yeah. So do you want me to restate it? No. Well, but that's but see that's a that's that's kind of that's kind of the key point there, right? So absent absent back pain. Okay. Absent that report. Deadlift um, done in the optimal range, that mm -hmm. blah, 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 you know, done safely, carefully, et cetera, would be a good option to exercise your hamstrings. Even without the report of pain, you don't know what's happening at the level of the discs, right? But, if, but, but at least start there, no complaints of back pain. If you already have that complaint, though, you're kind of flirting with the problem. Absolutely. Um, with a future problem or, or maybe in the case of back, an acute problem. Mm -hmm. um, 
so see, you, 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 that part throws off the advice that you already have in the back. So um, now the issue, of course, with the hamstrings is a lying flat leg curl where you face down um, also might contribute to back pain just because the um, problem with the leg curl machines is there's workarounds to every design to, if you don't want to avoid the back, if you don't want to involve the back negatively, you have to work around whatever design is out there. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because I have been looking for a, a hamstring exercise as well. Uh, what I've kind of settled on is a single hip extension. Now I have a, a freedom trainer, which is Nautilus version of the pulley, uh, double K, double pulley device. Mm -hmm. Although I imagine you could do this with an elastic band anchored to a door. And so one foot at a time, one foot at a time, the, the handle is around my foot. The pulley or the weight resistance is not vertical, but coming at a slight angle. And then I, uh, it looks like a step, but I'm really trying to sweep my leg back yeah. to match where my other leg is. Um, as well, since you, since you asked, I'll do a quick video. Um, and that seems to engage the glutes and the hamstrings with really minimal involvement in the back. Yeah, great point. Uh, now, I, I'm not as, you, you know, See, deadlifts, unlike squats, do have a real-world application. So if you're doing deadlifts with the proper spine posture, et cetera, and you're using them as practice lifting, so not necessarily training to failure, stopping well short of losing your spine posture, not only do they engage a lot of big muscles in your body, they're reinforcing good lifting practice. Yeah. Which... If you have kids, if you put stuff, if you put groceries in a car, if you do stuff around your yard or around your house, it'd be very helpful. So I would say, however, you wait until that back pain disappears because that's, <laughs> that's a real, that's a red flag. That's great advice. Uh, you can also do the same thing you described there, that hamstring exercise with a suspension trainer, like a TRX. I've got a knockoff TRX that's a lot cheaper, um, which which does the same thing. You, you hook the... TRX around the heel of the foot and do the same motion that you described. Um, I found it. Yeah. 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 So I, I found it to be very, at least it feels like it's really contracting the target muscle, the, the hamstring really effectively. Um, so anything's better than that goddamn boot bridge. Well, yeah. <laughs> the weighted, uh, whatever that silly thing is. You know, a fan of glute bridge then? Glute bridge? Glute bridge without weight. Yes, it's fine. The, okay, like one-legged Ray elevated glute bridges can work. Or even two work. legs, two if legs. It, yeah. If it's a, if it's again, as I describe, right? If you are okay, using the pelvis. If you're not using the abdominals or the erector spinae, if you're just using glutes, very valuable. Sorry, Bill, muscle. I don't have a J joint friendly fitness uh, recorded to memory yet. I should do, shouldn't I? <laughs> neither do I. Neither do I. That's yeah. if I wrote it, it's out of my head. No, nah, that's not true. But, <laughs> but I'm make, I'm make, but I'm making fun of the people putting barbells across their joints. Oh yeah, and right, right. So That's just a disaster. I see. But um, yeah. Um, um, but the glue, but the but the glute bridge really won't do much for your hamstrings. Okay, interesting. So yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, all right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, uh, let's see here. You might have already answered this to an extent. I have some back issues. I was wondering if you took Bill's advice and avoided deadlifts. And they may be referring to me. Okay. Um, which I don't really do deadlifts, so maybe I did. I find if I include them, deadlifts, in my workouts, eventually my lower back will start to hurt. Swiss ball leg curls are out as well because I have neck issues and lying on the floor causes me a lot of pain. Oh, sorry. That was um, connected to the question. That was just more oh, context. That, that guy read uh, congruent exercise. Okay. I think I had Swiss ball leg. Or what he read something where I had Swiss ball leg curls in there. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you've already given an alternative uh, hamstring exercise for him to try there. So hopefully. I think that's... I, you know what? I'll have to do a video on that one because it's hard to explain. And um, yeah. 
there seems to be interest in it. So I'll have to, I'll have to... See, send me the link when you have, and uh, obviously yeah. we'll link it from the show notes. Um, the next thing I wanted to touch on is um, blood flow restriction training. You said you had some experience of it. You're not a big fan. Uh, you said it leads to a larger point about intensity training techniques. So yeah, could you elaborate on this? Maybe we'll probably finish on this point, Bill, and do a. Oh, that was in, yeah, that was in the um, the the note I sent you. Yeah, that's right. So um, so so you know, if you, I think we've all accepted the sign of an effective set as um, okay, an effective conventional set. Mm -hmm. Your muscle strength feels depleted. Uh, you may have some burning. And when you stop, your muscles get pumped. Right? So you, we've done whatever, whatever rep scheme we're using. We've done our 10 reps in a minute. We've done our forced rep or a negative or whatever. And we experience those sensations. So that technique, um, <laughs> which guy here is a fan of, I'm not. Um, brings on those sensations to my eye prematurely. Mm, yeah, as if the point of as if the point of exercise was the sensations, right? Um, and, and I and I do think that a lot of um, I'll blame influencers again. I'll pick on influencers, but a lot of the advanced techniques are ways of short circuiting the work you do to get to those. So if those sensations are a sign of an effective set, they're misinterpreting the presence of those sensations as the sign of, an, of effective work. So for instance, if I have to do 10 repetitions of a curl and then take 30 seconds to lower the last rep, and my muscle feels depleted and it burns and it's pumped. Some of the advanced techniques I get espoused short second that the amount of work to get there and do something to get too fast to those effects. You do partial reps in the middle of the rep, you do an extended negative, you, you whatever, whatever technique you use to get to the effects, but you've short circuited the work. I am not so sure that the presence of the effects has the same physical benefit as doing the work to get those effects. And that just doesn't apply to the technique we're talking about, but it, to any advanced technique um, where the person confuses the effects with the result. Now, it's entirely possible people are just saying, okay, Boomer, you know, the old stuff is better. Well, <laughs> well. Yeah, you're right. That might it might be that, but again, if I if I spend I don't know three months three months leg pressing to the point where my quads burn and get pumped when I get off the machine, and then I go hike up a hill, and it's easier as a result of those three months of leg pressing. Do I think that short circuiting leg pressing to just bring on the effects will be just as effective at at applying that work mm -hmm. actually i don't mm, interesting I, I, yeah. I don't so yeah. i could be wrong um but it, it, it you know part of what what i think we like about training is the process like like it, it, again it's a cliche but if you could take a pill and get get built the way you want and not exercise yeah i'm not so sure a lot of us would do that I think a lot of us like the process. Uh, I, uh, although I would argue there's a lot of people that would do that. <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> maybe not in our space. And, and, and maybe. Yeah. And maybe. But what I'm just saying is I think a lot of us like the process of exercise. So short circuiting it. I'm not sure it actually works in terms of results, but it also um, deprives us of enjoying the process. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, I've, done, I've done a, uh, so way, way back, I did some, because blood flow restriction is not a new thing. It's been out for years. Um, and I did some content with uh, Dr. Jeremy Lowenecki, mm -hmm. many listeners will be familiar with. Um, and he, he did a whole bunch of research of his, um, his uh, research team. And uh, we talked about that. So you can go and you can go on the website and search Jeremy Lowenecki and, and learn all about that. And that was a long time ago. So I can't remember it very well. Um, 
I, I suspect yeah. recent new attention is commercially driven. Oh yeah, there's tons of it on, like you say, an influencer social media round. There there's loads of stuff about BFR. Lots there of really, go. really, yeah. Lots of really clickbaity headlines, products and services, et cetera. Um, and what I concluded with Jeremy, and this is again from memory, so go back and listen to the podcast and maybe I'm slightly wrong about this. But what I remember the outcome of it, it was like, so Jeremy, does BFR produce better results? No, the same. Okay. So it's just basically the same outcome, no superior benefit, right. But the utility, and again, this is if I recall correctly, the utility was you could train with far less intensity. So this might conflict with what you said a little bit. Uh, you could train with lower intensity and still get great benefits. So they were thinking about people who are injured or um, people that can't train hard or whatever, who want to maintain or grow muscle or at least get some benefit. The, 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 I think, I think that one of the claims was that blood flow restriction could have some utility there and really help with that. Um, and I think, again, another argument was that it just shortens. This is because you're saying about, well, hey, it's develop, delivering all these sensations, but are those sensations really, um, uh, transforming into actual benefit? And I think the argument during the podcast was that they are, it just shortens the whole process. Um, but again, need to listen to the podcast to verify that, but. I, I tried it and I found it so physically miserable. I wasn't interested in pursuing it. Oh, I see. I haven't actually done it. I must admit, I had never done it myself. Oh, so it's not I, nice. I yeah. Very <laughs> physically miserable. And, Interesting. And, and I'm not a beginner. I'm not a frail 90 year old. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. you're I'm super not sure strong. Where the application is. Bring chicken. <laughs> um, yeah, fair enough. So I'll refer back to those podcasts though for more on that. And that is obviously Jeremy actually diving into the science that him and his colleagues did um bill i think before we wrap we should address this last slide if that's okay um so we got the question about pullovers you touched us a bit already what gives pullovers such low ratings in joint friendly fitness is it the fact that poor weight selection and the power of gravity will lead to overstretching the shoulders so i'm pretty sure that person's referring to the free weight version not the um mm -hmm. not the station not the cam station pull up. So, um, yes, make a long story short. Yes. Um, it's bad. Um, the leverage works definitely in the wrong way. So the, the free weight pullover, when your arms are completely overhead, creates a huge lever in favor of the weight. Peak muscle torque for the shoulders is at 90 degrees of flexion. So where the, pull, the, where the free weight pullover is hardest, your shoulders are weakest and most vulnerable. And where the free weight, where your shoulders are strongest and safest, there's no lever to work against. So when you... When the dumbbell pullover, when the dumbbell is over your shoulders, there's no lever to work against. That's mm -hmm. where your lats are strongest. So that's what made that such a good selection for a machine or a station. Um, because extreme ranges of motion aside, you could manipulate that so that you're not loading the extreme position and you could make that hardest um, where your lats are strongest. Um, so the poor weight selection, you know, I guess that gets back to the story of, of me watching a guy take dumb, progressively heavier dumbbells off the rack, lying back on a bench, putting the dumbbell in what he thinks is the starting position, saying, oh, it's too light, until finally he gets a weight, a weight that's heaviest in the starting position. Okay, this is about right. And when yeah. he comes back, <laughs> the leverage works completely against his favor and he dislocates his shoulders. Um, now Ellington Darden said to me, well, why didn't the guy start from the floor? Then he would know right away the weight was too heavy. Well, that's a good point. Mm. And that's the reason is they've never, there's never been a picture in, in a muscle magazine or a book showing that exercise starting from the floor. Right. So people, people are accustomed to thinking of, okay, we start with the weight here. If, if the group think was we start with the weight on the floor it would be a moot point but um yeah 
Related to this, by the way, is this, the next comment from another bill who talks about this. Uh, oh, you, and in fact, you mentioned this. Uh, the, this We did. I felt this. Well, we can address this. I thought we did cover this in the last one. We did yeah, cover well, hanging. Just, just briefly. The, just briefly, the yeah, sure. The therapeutic value of straight hanging down from the shoulder. And um, without belaboring this too much, um, moving the arm overhead is much more compl complex internally as this diagram, the next slide you have uh, shows scapular humeral rhythm. Should we show that? Shows the in go ahead, yeah. Yep, there we go. So, so moving your arm overhead is much more complicated than exercise would have you believe. Um, and, you know, and the internal structures of the shoulder. So hanging all that weight in that position, it may, it may be relevant to some, to some specific shoulders, but as a general rule, conventional wisdom, probably not a great idea. Um, again, not to say never hang there. It does feel, as a stretch, it, feel, it does feel like some relief. But to make a habit of hanging your full body weight off your rotator cuff, um, it, it, what the sports medicine books call it the humorous migrating upward. So specific to say tennis or baseball, when the arm is coming overhead and the force is made, it, your arm just doesn't come overhead when you're throwing or, or serving. The force is encouraging the humerus to migrate upward. Right. That action of the humerus migrating upwards is what leads to impingements and tears, et cetera. I see. So again, probably no academic lit literature attaching, hanging your body weight and shoulder injuries because it's so new, but there's plenty of information about the humerus migrating upward with force or with a load and shoulder injuries. Yeah, right, okay, interesting. So that exact thing may not, ha may not be contraindicated, but things like it are, so. Yeah. But again, which isn't to say that some people's shoulders might feel better with it. They might, and I, I can't argue with someone's observation, but. Right, um, personal anecdotes, many of those. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's interesting because I used to hang all the time. Um, it was like a daily thing I did um, to, to try and improve my own shoulders. I don't do it anymore. Not, I mean, maybe, I think um, certainly conversation with you have made me kind of uh, uh, rethink that. Um, it's also just, frankly, I've just not made time to do it. Uh, I've just been focused on other things, but I still obviously do, you know, plenty of strength training for my shoulder girdle, right? And so, and, you know, I have had, I was actually probably doing it more because I have a history with a, a, a tendinopathy in my right shoulder, um, brought on by basketball, I believe. And um, although that's even up for debate, but it was certainly the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back was a block. I did an overhand. So I, I had a, oh, a okay. I okay. had a, a, a preference, even if it was more efficient for me to block with my left, I would always use my right. It was like a bad habit. So swinging the arm to block in basketball over like that really right. aggressively. Um, and then it just started really, uh, really getting bad. I won't get into it. The, the listeners have heard me talk about this probably a ton on previous episodes. So I won't go into all the details, but needless to say, the things that actually have really helped are probably consistent, safe, smart strength training around the shoulder, but also just not using my right hand for as many things. So I don't scroll on my phone on my right, or I don't use my mouse oh, with my right hand because okay. it's the 10. And this was Doug McGuff's argument. He, he said to me just privately, like, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're exacerbating the inflammation by using that, using those tendons. So again, I'm oversimplifying that. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so I thought that was fascinating. I hadn't even thought of that at all. And um, so he gave me different protocols to try and things. But yeah, so so has the hanging been a benefit or a negative? I can't actually say. <laughs> it's too too hard to say. It's too many confounders. It's too short a time frame, et cetera, sure. et cetera. And your sure. your argument does it does is it is a good argument. I mean, it does make sense to me what you're saying. What we're hanging a lot uh, might not be a good idea. Well, uh, you know, it's also, it's very tough 
you have to check with the academic guys on this, but the few ethics in academics course I took, you can't really run a study to prove a negative, to prove something harmful. Because if you're right, you've harmed the subjects. <laughs> right. So, right, right. Um, again, now, now look, in fairness, I have the assisted chin machine here, right? I regularly hold on, I'm not hanging from it, but I will hold on it and bend my knees and sink my weight into a little bit as a stretch. Sure. But I'm not hanging my whole body weight on it for an extended time. Um, so, you know, the context matters, your individual shoulders matter. But again, if you're talking about conventional wisdom, the humerus migrating upward puts the shoulder in a vulnerable position. So, sure. yeah. Yeah. And I, I haven't noticed any, any shoulder issues since really. I just noticed that if I too much laptop stuff, too much use of the right hand, it starts to get at me a little bit. Um, but, but, but apart from that, I don't really have much issue. Um, Bill, I think what we should do is park it here and continue the part three, if that's okay with you in the new year, um, sure. and address the rest of these questions. Cause there's still a whole load for, uh, for an additional episode for sure. Um, but just before we wrap up here, so let's just make sure everyone knows um, how to connect with you. So what are we, what are we, where are we sending people? So anyway, just go down a slide or two. Oh yeah. Down to uh, this whoop, one. Whoop, back, up, back, oh, up, back up. Oh yeah. You got the Kindles. Ah, right there. Yeah. So those are, those are drafts of uh, what's coming up. Uh, the shoulders and arms should be out. These are drafts of Kindle covers. Mm -hmm. Um completely play by the way so i want them to look good as a thumbnail so the first one coming out will be shoulders and arms so that will be excerpts from the big print book but you didn't ask for me to do a forward on any of these <laughs> i ran out of, i ran out of uh i ran out of stuff to, actually i i i, I, I miss it i've missed it do not ask no, no, me no, for no, that no. i have i have in the course of doing these i realized i have a fourth one which i didn't think i had um, cause, cause you've made this point. A few people have made this point about the idea of routines, which to me, is oh, yeah. second nature. I don't yeah. think about it until I talk to somebody for whom they don't have the same experience I have. So I realized as I'm finishing these, I was like, oh, I have a fourth one where I could just compile the routines in one Kindle or one paperback. And, and that might be useful. So you absolutely, ah, no, so, anyway, no, so, so each of these. I've excerpted the parts from Joint Friendly Fitness print specific to that. So instead of the full biomechanics chapters, it's just the shoulders and arms portion. And then I'm putting in new routines um, for each. So in, in Joint Friendly Fitness, I kind of defaulted to like a Darden-ish overall body workout scheme, um, which I generally like, but I also... I also know that people like, and, and myself, you like to dabble in more specific work or specific muscles for whatever reason. Um, summer's coming up. You want to fit better in clothes for an occasion. Um, oh. You know, or, or, or you just- Sun's out, guns out. Or you're, yeah, but or you just sell, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. like 10 exercises, two times a week, close to failure. Might be all you physically need to benefit from exercise, but you do it for 40, 50 years, it gets old. Oh. So you, you, you may want to change the routine up and say, okay, this week I'm going to do extra shoulders and arms or I'm going to, and, and, and just to see what happens. Yeah. Um, so I have new individual routines written for all of these. Um, so this is going to be like the Reader's Digest version of I love it. So they'll be like split routines. Like if you just want to do a shoulders and arms routine, there'll be routines like that, will there? Well, you know something? Splitting is one way of handling it. Um, I like it. I remember Darden. Darden um, I noticed even non-fans default to a split routine. Like my daughter said, Dad, I want you to work me out. Then I want you to give me a routine. I say, well, okay. She says, I go to the gym four days a week. I do <laughs> shoulders and buys. I do chest and tries. So I do everything else. I say, Amanda, why don't you just do it all in one visit? And she says, Dad, I work by myself. I live by myself. I'm going to the gym for a night. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, that never, 
that never occurred mm-hmm. to me. Having grown up on the Mensa and the Darden stuff, that never occurred to me that that's probably a better idea than going to a bar. So I said, okay. Right. So, so even non-aficionados kind of default to a split routine. Yeah. Because, of ex- you know, Mensa used to write that, you know, some people go to the gym just to go to the gym. I go to the gym to get something done and get on with my life. Well, where's that effect? And I always bit on that until I realized, wait a minute, some people, it's not a negative to them. Yeah, it's still quite, it's still quite, it is social media, but it's still quite pervasive, the idea that it's more effective. And and it's prevent, right. Yeah. So, um, so rather than try to correct it, I said, all right, well, let me, let me, let me steer this in a better direction as opposed to trying to correct it because. Okay. So how do people find, when are these going to be available? Are they used to working on those or? Um, end is of this... December, end of January, end of, uh, uh, shoulders and arms, end of December, core Got and it. legs, end of January, back and chest, end of. Okay, so at least uh, so one, at least one or maybe two will be out when this is published in that case, which will okay, be yeah. late December, January at this stage. And yeah. the, um, the, um, so the, the best place to go there is the Amazon uh, biographer page where, where you know, yeah. new stuff is announced. In the very next slide, we can talk about this next time. You, I think you might be interested in this. We'll park this oh, for I, next time, the workout routine. Oh, okay. No, no, that, that was fine. Yeah. Uh, I have a little, little more simplified graphic on that, but I started calling that, I don't know if this thing will stick, a whole body carousel. So, you know, if you do, if you do one set to failure, 10 different exercises, whole body routine. Obviously, the first exercise you're going to perform better on. The later ones, you're either going to, drag out the workout to rest more, or your performance is going to suffer a little bit because you're gassed. So, sure. And I don't like dragging out the workout, even though I have the place and I have the time. I, I don't, I just don't like, I like for my own self. And I realize, oh, this isn't bad. I organize it into groups of three exercises. First three, second three, last three. And the first three, I'll use a high intensity plus technique because I'm fresh. Sure. The second three, I just do a standard 10 reps in one minute. And then the last three, it's a little lighter weight. And I do, in effect, the pump set. And then the next day or the next workout, I rotate which three are first, which three are second, which three are third. Oh, I love it. And so on and so forth. And I find for me, that scratches the itch for novelty, mm. right? Um, and instead of doing a workout and say, gee, maybe I'll do negatives today, or maybe I'll do breakdowns today, or or well, what weight am I using on the breakdown last time I did it? I, I said, you know what, stick with the whole body. The whole body routine is very centering, right? Mm-hmm. It kind of gets you back on track. But it runs the risk of getting stale. But if you, if you rotate the order of the exercises in the pattern, and the first ones you throw the extra techniques on, and then the last one you finish on a pump, so you, feel, you don't feel as quite as debilitated at the end of the workout as opposed to grinding on all 10 exercises, all nine exercises. Um, it's a way to get some more mileage out of the whole body idea, the whole body routine idea. Yeah. So, which I, like I will it. elaborate on. Yeah, sounds great. So, um, so obviously you've got the details there. You've got the Amazon bio page, where to find you. You've got the YouTube channel and you've got your LinkedIn. We'll link up all this stuff in um, everywhere this is posted, YouTube, social media, uh, and the blog, highintensitybusiness.com. And with that said, Bill, thank you so much. This has been great. I always enjoy these Q&As with you. And I, li- I like that we go on our little tangents. Hopefully, the listeners and viewers enjoyed kind of just listening to us explore these different things that we wrestle with um, and, and, and those little discussion points. Um, and yeah, just appreciate your time and looking forward to part three and, and, and getting all the questions answered. Um, to get that for everyone listening, to get the show notes for this episode, uh, please head over to highintensitybusiness.com and search for episode 448, or you can just click podcast list and all the podcasts will come up. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go-to for safe, simple, and effective high intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment 
that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. The team at Imagine Strength breathes HIT. Their passion for high-intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of HIT Studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a HIT business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the HIT industry forward and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your HIT business the Imagine Strength edge. Be part of the HIT revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your HIT business with Imagine Strength. Let's go, let's go.